Okay. I'll tell you an interesting halachic shayla I heard in the meantime, before we start, uh, we heard the guys get here. So there's a guy, guy apparently, uh, he want, his, his wife was upset with him for some reason. So he decided he wants to bring her a bouquet of flowers. He was living in B'nai Brak. So what did he do? He went to the cemetery in Tel Aviv, there's a secular cemetery, where, where, where people bring flowers and put them on the tombstones in Tel Aviv. It's not a Jewish custom. Jews don't put flowers on tombstones. So he went, he went to the cemetery and he picked up a bouquet of flowers and he brought it home to his wife, gave her flowers, nice bouquet of flowers from the cemetery. So, okay. So then there was a halachic question was asked to one of the biggest posts came today. Is it okay to do such a thing? Because there's a halacha that you're not allowed to get any, thank you, thank you, Israel. There's a halacha that you're not allowed to get any benefit. You know, some, we're missing a, a row of tables here, aren't we? Where they're usually there are two tables, it's two tables thick. Somehow we're missing. Yeah, this, the middle one is two tables thick, isn't it, usually, isn't it? Oh, I thought it was two tables thick, okay. So there's a, uh, what do you call it? There's a halacha that you're not allowed to get any benefit from the, a dead body. You can't use a dead body. Uh, organ transplants is only if there's only if it's an immediate use to save somebody's life. You can't even use organs for research. But if there's immediate use, then you can take an organ from a, from somebody who's fully dead. You gotta be fully dead. You can't kill them. You have to be fully dead. So here the question was: Did he do something wrong by taking the flowers from the tombstone? <laughs> I got this here. First of all, his wife better never find out. Otherwise, otherwise he's gonna have his own tombstone. Right, so that's the first thing, you know. The first question, you make sure your wife does well. Don't ever do that, guys. Don't ever go take flowers from a cemetery for your wife. But then there became a halachic question. Please close that door there. It became a halachic question whether or not he's allowed. What do you say? Is there something wrong? Huh? No, somebody bought it with intention and he's stealing it. He's stealing it. Plus of that, if you buy a plot, that's it's like your property kind of. Well, who's, who's property? I don't know. I mean, you rented that property. Who rented it? The person who paid for the plot bought it so that somebody could be buried there. The person who's buried there doesn't own anything. They got bigger problems. The person, well, maybe who the person who put the flowers there paid for it. A person who paid for the plot, I mean, they may have. Something else who, that he paid for on the, on the but when he put the flowers there, who were the flowers for? For himself. No, he didn't put the flowers there for himself. He it, maybe. It, it may, maybe he feels good, but does he feel he owns those flowers? A guy who puts flowers on a tombstone usually walks away and never expects to see the flowers again. Those flowers are hefker. It may be crude, you know, it's not, it may be crude to go to cemeteries and collect flowers, but it's not, you haven't stolen it. Who did you steal it from? You didn't steal it from the deceased because he doesn't own anything. You didn't steal it from the what he called, you didn't steal it from the guy who put it there because he made it hefker. I'm telling you, there's a shayla that came up. So you know what the Rav Paskin, he said, not only you're allowed to take it, there's no problem taking it because the deceased is a Jew. And the last thing he wants is that some non-Jewish custom was, perp was perpetrated on his tombstone. You're doing him a favor. If the In other words, like this, if the dead could talk, what would he say to you? He said, get those flowers out of here. That's what he'd say. He don't want those flowers there. What's he going to do with flowers? It's a non-Jewish custom. He doesn't want them. You're actually doing him a favor. Having said that, Having said that, I'm only telling you the Shiloh that came out. Don't do it, gentlemen. I don't want anybody leaving here. Don't leave right now. I don't want anybody leaving here. Oh, Kaplan said, let's go to the cemetery, guys. I got news for you. I'm a Kohen. So I can't go into the cemetery anyway. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> it's going to cost me next Friday when I buy flowers. You know, I thought I had an angle. I got excited for a second. Hey, maybe I'll make a shliach. <laughs> Anybody want to do me a favor? Can be in Tel Aviv anytime soon, Ellie. I can, can do me a favor. If you happen to be in Tel Aviv, maybe uh, <laughs> if you can find some purple ones, that's her favorite color. <laughs> Possibilities are endless over here. Okay, that's uh, that, it's just an interesting guy. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Okay. Uh, page 484. We're starting Parshas Kisisa. Okay. Parshas Kisisa. And uh, um, the, Vaydabra uh, Hashem al 484. Kisisa es Rosh B'nai Yisrael Lifkudehem. When you take a count of the Jewish people and their numbers, 
V'nasnu ish kofer nafsheh la'ashem. Each person should give an atonement for his soul to Hashem, bifkod osam, when you count them. V'lo yevem negef bifkod osam. There will not be a plague when you count them. Now, uh, the, the, the basic idea here is that uh, um, when, when you count the Jewish people, everybody knows when we count Jews, we don't, we don't count one, two, three, four. Well, how do you count when you want to know if you have a minion in shul? Hoshia es amecho varech es sefra. We say a pasuk that has words, ten words in it. So if we get to hoshia es amecho varech es nachal sefra, we're aiming on same. Out of olam, we know we've got a minion. So it's interesting we use that pasuk because what does that pasuk mean? Hoshia es amecho, deliver your people, save your people. Hoshia uvarech and bless nachal es nachal sefra, bless your people. Because if you count one, two, three, four, that could trigger off a plague on the Jewish people. Why is it? Why is it when you count? So we're not, we're not counting heads, we're counting words. By the way, you could also do in shul, if you want to find out if there are ten people, you always say, Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech olam hamotzi lecha bina oretz. Because I've also got ten, just don't take a bite out of anybody. But, the, but you could theoretically, you could do that. But the custom among the Jewish people is to say, Hoshia samecha. Because we're not counting heads, we're counting words. So over here, Moshe Rabbeinu is told, give everybody, have everybody, uh, when they count them, when they count the Jewish people, how do you, to avoid a plague, how do you do it? Says the Rah, Zeyitnu kola over halapikudim, this is what they should give. Next pasuk. Machatzisa shekel b'shekel koit, a half shekel koit. What they should give is a half shekel koit. Esrim gera shekel, machatzisa shekel truma l'ashem. They give a half shekel koit. And what do they do? Then you count the coins. So that's always the custom. You don't count heads, you count the coins. Why not? Because when you count people, it could trigger off a plague. Why does it trigger off a plague? Because you're counting people, there's this idea of ayin hara. There's an idea of ayin hara. You're talking about okay, you're giving a number of the people that's an ayin hara. Number one. Number two, the uh, 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 the, the 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 custom is to count to count the items because then it's not a direct focus on the people themselves. One of the commentaries says also, when you count people. If you go one, two, three, four, what you're really doing is counting bodies. Counting bodies means you're putting a little too much emphasis on the physical. They go, we're more than bodies. Notice the wording of the Torah. It says, Kisisa es Rosh take a head count. Why the head? That's where our seichel is, where it's anyway it's supposed to be. Right? That's where the intelligence is supposed to be. We're more than just a body. Jews are more than just that. We're not just here for the bodies. To count bodies, one, two, three, four, how many bodies are in this room? One, two, three, four, when you count like that, that could trigger off a plague on the Jewish people. And therefore, the custom has always been that you count with items, you count with coins. Now, why does the Torah use a ter- an expression over here? It uses a strange expression. It says, each one, when you count them, each one will give an atonement for his soul. I mean, you're just taking a census over here. I actually worked on the census in 1980. In Chicago, I worked on the census. You had to do a course, and then, uh, and then you worked there. You became a census taker. You had to knock on random doors, which was also an interesting experience. You knock on random doors, and you go in. I remember this Korean family. I knocked on the door, and I said, hi, I'm here to say. They, he was so nervous. I don't look like a, like a thug, you know, I certainly didn't at the time, maybe now, yeah. But, you know, okay, and he let me, you know, he let me, he let me in, he was just sitting on the couch, answering, they were so nervous, it could be because they were immigrants, and immigrants are always nervous about people asking them questions, you know, who are you hiding in the closet over there, you know, or whatever it is. But, I, and, and that's when I noticed the kind of waste, of, I actually saw the waste of government money. Because this is a government census in the United States, it was the decade census in 1980, and I had, a, I had a, the, my direct supervisor, was a, uh, not a Jewish guy, Todd Banner, that was his name. Hey, Todd, if you're out there, right, Todd Banner was my, and I just remember, he was, I was getting paid three bucks an hour. He was getting paid five bucks an hour as a supervisor. And I just remember that I, came, I had to go to his house with my, one of the forms, and I said, by the way, I don't have all the information on this one. He said, give me that thing, will you? And he just took out his pen and just started filling in random stuff. He didn't care. And I realized, and there was so much money wasted in this, you know, the, the millions of dollars are wasted. And I was trying to do it, I'm filling out every little form, or he just took the thing and just started writing in whatever it was to make his five bucks. He, he was getting, I think he was getting paid by the form, actually. The more forms he got filled out, he was actually getting paid by the form. 
So he was just, you know, as fast as the hand could move. So, so the, 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 what do you call it? So here, here is the, uh, here, here is the uh, uh, what do you call it? The Torah says it's an atonement. Why an atonement? What's my fault that we're being counted? Why do we need an atonement? The Torah says, well, the Jewish people need an atonement when they're being counted. Why do you need an atonement? The answer is, what, what causes, I knew I put it there somewhere, what causes, <laughs> behave, what causes population change? What? Boy, you're a, you're a pessimist, right? <laughs> Any, why plague? Any sort of death. You know, some people do die of old age in bed surrounded by family. You know, not everybody dies in a plague. You know, that's what he calls it. So, so yes, death causes population change. Well, why is there death in the world? Death is a result of sin. If there's death, there's a result of sin. And theoretically, if a person dies, that's also a form of, it's also a form of punishment. So we need an atonement because there's death. Why, why, why are we behaving in a way that there's still death in the world? And therefore, even any count, any count is going to need some sort of atonement. So the Torah says that it's lifkudehem, it's kofer nafsho l'ashem bifkodo sam, velo yebem negif, and there won't be a plague if you count them with the machatzis shekel coin. Now, if you take a look in Pasuk Yud Beis, the next Pasuk says, ze yitnu, oh, vindosidu, sorry, 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 second line, second line, sorry, Pasuk Yud Beis, yeah, Pasuk Yud Beis. Second line, take a look at the word vindosidu. Do you see the word vinasnu? Anything unique about that word? Yeah. Third word on the second line. Vinasnu, they shall give. You spell it the reverse same thing? Back and forward. What's that called in English? Do you know what, the type, of, what type of word it is called? Very good. Ooh, I'm impressed. It's a palindrome. It's a palindrome. Vinasnu. It's a palindrome. Why, why is that word a palindrome? Vinasnu goes out and comes back. Yeah, very good, very good, very good. When you give, you get. We're talking about giving a donation. You know, giving donations, I was just spoken at a dinner last night in a shul that's trying to raise money. So I spoke at the dinner, I just told him the story, you know, as a rabbi gets up in his shul, he says, ladies and gentlemen, we have to build a new wing on our synagogue, and I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is we've already got the money. The bad news is it's in your pockets. <laughs> so here you're talking about donations for the shul over here, you know, donations for the Mishkan. And there's a whole discussion over exactly how these donations work. The bottom line is that we're talking about tzedakah. And tzedakah is, we're told, that the more you give, the more you get. When you give tzedakah, you don't lose out. We've spoken about this in the past. And therefore the Torah emphasizes that the word vinasanu, it goes out and it comes back. Now, what's interesting over here, and this is the point that I really wanted to get to today, or at least one point. Look at the word for counting. Kisisa es rosh b'nei Israel. And what does the word kisisa really mean? Naso. Kisisa. Anybody know what does, what does that word mean, kisisa? It really means when you raise. You pick up. Why, why, the Torah should say kisispor. How do you say to count? How do you say to count? Kisispor. Lispor. Right? Lispor. Kisispor. Why does it say kisisa? Why is a key seesaw? When you, when you raise, literally, when you raise the heads of the Jewish people. And the Torah is using it in this term, in terms of counting. So the answer is, the answer is that, you know, there's a story. These two guys go to the, these two guys go to the fair. Two, two uh, you know, back in the day when they used to have the fair in Leipzig or in all these places, you know, they used to go to, go, you know, go to the fair to buy, buy their, buy. so there's one guy who's got a little shop. And there's another guy who's got a whole chain of, a chain of stores. So they go to the fair to buy supplies, and they're buying on credit. So the guy at the little shop, he goes in, and he buys himself, you know, a little bit, a few supplies there, and he loads them up on his, loads them up on his donkey, and, he, and he's all set to go. The other guy's got about 20 wagons that he fills up with supplies. And they start riding home together, and the guy, the guy with the chain stores, he looks at the other guy, goes... And look at you and look at me. I mean, <laughs> look how much you got. Look how much I got. You don't have very much. Look how much I got. The guy says, oh, that's true. On the other hand, look how much you owe and look how much I owe. And, you, know, you owe a whole lot more than I do. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means that sometimes we look at other people and what they're accomplishing. person has to know 
that the accomplishment is only relative. Listen, if you got more ability and more talent, we expect more from you. Somebody with less ability, let's say a person has an incredible ability to sit and study Torah with incredible concentration. There are people who are born with the concentration. Then there are the rest of us who are ADD or ADHD or whatever letters they've saddled us with today. You know, and just, just about everybody I meet today is ADHD. Right? I haven't met, if you're not, you know, they, I almost faint. Right? But everybody's, got, everybody's got some sort of label today. So a guy who's born with great concentration skills, so what do we expect? We expect you to sit and study longer. So to, terrific, you've got a different gift. You, let's say you have a, a higher intelligence. You've got more intelligence. I expect you to be able to study, to study and understand deeper and to maybe study more masechtas and finish shas more times. So the guy with less intelligence or less concentration ability, we don't expect as much. You have to do, I have to do, whatever I'm capable of doing, try to maximize my potential. You have to maximize your potential. It's very easy in this religion to look at other people and start getting a little, uh, you know, what am, what am I worth really? At the end of the day, how much am I really worth compared to this guy? You know, sometimes you take a walk in B'nai Brak, take a walk in B'nai Brak and you see, you see Tzadikim or Tamide Chachamim, every Dalit Amos, you see another, you go into Me'a Sharm and you hear some little kid, you ever been at a Shabbos table, you know, where some little seven-year-old already knows 12 Masechtas by heart. And you're, and you're like, whoa, you know, and it, 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 could, it could get to you. Let's face it, it could get to you. You know, well, how can, boy, if I would have started early, but you didn't. You didn't. You started where Kosh Baruch put you. I started where Kosh Baruch put me. I can't look at where this kid who's the seventh generation Yerushalmi, and the worst thing that he's ever done is that, he, that he's a Davin Shemon Esrei too fast. You know, they once asked, they once asked Rav Chaim Kenevsky if his father, the stipler, ever, ever spanked him. Did he ever, did he ever use corporal? They asked Rav Chaim Kenevsky. He said, yeah, I got potched. He says, can you give me an example of something you did wrong? Can you imagine Rav Chaim Kenevsky? What did he do right? He didn't shoot a spitball in class. That I can tell you. Right? So what did Rav Chaim, what could he have done wrong? So he said he was once in shul, and they were saying tachnon. You know where you would go down tachnon? There were no chairs. So he sat on the floor. He was about six years old. He sat on the floor to do tachnon. So Stipler gave him a smack. He said, don't do, don't do strange things. Don't do that. Don't sit on the floor. That was, that was his idea of not being naughty, right? Was, was, was saying tachnun on the floor in shul. How have I, you know, if, our, if that was our idea of being naughty, we'd be okay, right? Uh, by us, we're, we hope to say tachnun in a chair in shul. Uh, if we're doing that, we're doing okay. He was, that was his idea. Okay, so everybody, you know, his uncle was the chazonish. His father was the stipler. So we can't compare ourselves to Reb Chaim Kinevsky. So the Torah is telling you over here, it's easy for a guy to look at himself and say, what am I worth? I mean, I don't think I'm capable of more. Comes along the Torah says, Kisisa is Rosh B'nai Israel. Moshe Feinstein says, you're going to pick them up. You know how you pick people up? Because every but single person, take a look, everybody's going to give a machatzis a shekel. Who's going to give it? Take a look at Pesach Yudalit. Five lines from the top. Kol over ala pekudim. Everybody's going to be counted. Mi ben esrim shan of amal from 20 years and on. Yitain truma Hashem, he's going to give the offering. He'oshir lo yarbe lo yami. The wealthy man doesn't give more, and the, uh, the, the, the poor man doesn't give less. Mimachatzi sashekel. Everybody's even here. You look at it, the poor man looks at the rich man. What about the, what, what, what am I worth compared? Every single Jew is giving a machatzi that We're all even over here. Because ultimately, we don't know in the eyes of Hashem who, who, who weighs more. We don't know who's, we don't know, you know, you guys look at the guys in Mir, the guys in the Mir Yeshiva, or you guys in Panovich, or the guys all around, you know, like, wow, look at these guys, yeah. Who te- I think each one of you is worth a lot more than that. Look where you've come from, look where they've come from. The guys, guys seventh generation uh, B'nai Brak, and only speaks Aramaic, you know, oh, well, big deal. You know, I, I know, what about somebody who pulled himself up, who's got f- family pressure, who's not happy that he's from, not happy that he's in yeshiva, and, and, and somebody's struggling with it, i got to learn a new, you know, it's like to learn Gemara. The guy, the guy, the guy's been learning Gemara his whole life. Some guy comes to Gemara when he's 25 years old. i got to learn a new language, a new method of thinking, I knew everything, this is double Dutch over here. Right? How can you measure that compared to a guy who's been talking since, since day one he's been in the house playing shul? That's what kids play. I'm telling you, that's what kids play. Did you play shul Shabbos morning? What did you play Shabbos morning? Shabbos morning, you either play baseball or you watch cartoons. 
And my kids grew up, my kids would play shul on Shabbos morning. One day he takes a big beach towel and he puts it on and he's the chazan and another guy's the gabai and the third guy's the guy who yells at the gabai, you know, and, and, the, and it always ended with an ufruf, right? I threw candy. That, 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 that was a game. That was a game for kids to play. How can you compare yourself, honestly? By the way, I don't know if Catholics play church Sunday morning, you know. All right, let's play church. Okay. <laughs> come here, come here, Tom. We're to, time to nail you up, <laughs> you know. No, no. <laughs> no, no, get Bill. He got me last week. I still got I still got the band-aids from last week. No, no, get Bill. You know, I don't think they play. Have some wafers. You know, I don't know. At the end of the at the end, at the, at the, have some wafers and booze. I don't know. At the end of the day, then we can't compare ourselves. So it comes along the Torah and says over here. So it says over here, Vitisa is right. You pick up the people. Pick them up. You know how much you're worth? You're worth as much as the rich guy gives. But he gives a lot more tzedakah than the guy. You know, there's a rich guy who gives a tremendous amount of tzedakah. I can only give 10% of my meager salary. 20%. Of, you know what the villain going says? It's easier to fulfill your tzedakah obligations when you don't have a lot of money than when you do have a lot of money. A guy, a guy could give away, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, he could give away millions of dollars. It's still not ten percent of his income, because you got to keep track of that new, that new, in, the, 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 what do you call it? You got a new investment over there that's paying you dividends. Well, you got to meister that money also. You don't even know where the money's coming from. You don't even know how much money you got. So a person has to know. A person has to know. Listen, you know, uh, who? So a poor man, uh, a man who doesn't have a lot of money, well, you make hundred thousand dollars a year. Give your ten thousand dollars, and you finally fulfilled your obligation hundred percent. The guy's got a hundred million dollars; he doesn't even know how much he's got. He doesn't even know how much money. He can't even keep track of it. So maybe he's given; he could give ten million dollars away, and it's still not ten percent of his income. So who's? Well, God doesn't look at numbers. God looks at what you're trying to do as a person. How much of your potential you'll fulfill. Number one. Number two. I'll show you. Take a look at the word machatzitz, gentlemen. Did you ever hear the idea? Did you ever hear the idea that um, what do we do on Erev Yom Kippur? There are three things we do. It's printed in the Machzer: Tshuva, Tfila, Utsidaka, Ma'avirin Esroa Hagzer. Did you ever hear that idea? Tshuva, which it says in the Machzer. In every Machzer, if you look, it says three things. Every of those words: Utshuva, Utfila. Everybody chants it together. What is tshuva? Tshuva is, and it says in the Matzer, fasting. Tshuva, tfila is davening. Utsidaka, and giving tzedakah. So there's an idea. Tzedaka tatzil mimoves. Tzedaka saves from death. That's what the Gemara says. Tzedaka tatzil mimoves. Why? Why does, excuse me, why does tzedaka save from death? Anybody know? If you give tzedakah, the merit of tzedakah, excuse me, the merit of tzedakah could actually save from death. Why? Exactly. That's the most basic idea is that when, let's say in the old days, a guy's literally starving. So he needs to buy a loaf of bread. And a loaf of bread costs 10 cents. And he's got 9 cents. And you give him one penny, and now with that penny he can buy a loaf of bread, so what have you done with your one penny? You've saved, his, you've saved his life. The guy could go buy a loaf of bread. You've saved the guy's life. Because now the guy could eat. He who saved the life by giving tzedakah, therefore you also merit that your life is saved. Mita connected mita, number one. Number two, it's more than that. Where did, where did you get money from to begin with? Where does anybody get money from? God. What's that? From God. You're, that's, a, that's certainly true. And how does God expect you to get that? How does he deliver it to you? I don't know how Hashem delivers it to you. I know how he delivers it to me, and I deliver it to most people. You're right, it comes from Hashem. Li HaKesef, the Pesach says. Li HaKesef, all the money is mine. Hashem's loaded. That's true. Hashem's very rich. More and more in Buffett. Right? Hashem's loaded. But how does Hashem get the money to us? We work. Some people do. Some people work. Some people teach. <laughs> I told you, Woody Allen said, those who can't do, teach. And those who can't teach, teach phys ed. That's what Woody Allen said. And by the way, I was a phys ed major in college. So I've got all the qualifications. So I've never worked a day in my life. But what do you call it? The, 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 uh, the, what do you call it? The, the, you, you work. When you're working, what are you doing? You're giving up your life because it's your time. Time is life. Time is life. If I go and mow your lawn for an hour, I've just given up an hour of my life to mow your lawn. So you're paying me for that hour of my life. 
So now you give me money, you pay me 20 bucks, and I go give $2 to somebody else. What have I just done? I've just given up a piece of my life. I've given a guy a piece of my life. Oh, you're willing to give up a piece of your life? I go to the says, in return, you get life. I heard a story once, there was a guy, guy gets a knock on his door Thursday night. A, a Kolol student, a Kolol guy gets a knock on his door. And there's this lady kind of, you know, a bit deranged. She knocks on the door. She says, I want a piece of chicken. I want a piece, Thursday night, I want a piece of chicken. So the guy he has a big family, and he doesn't have much money, he's studying in Kolo, and he counts pieces of chicken for Shabbos. There are people who live like that, by the way. They actually, they have rations on their, on, their, on their chicken on Shabbos because they just don't have a lot. And he says, listen, I have, you know, I only got one chicken, I got seven kids, you know, it's ration, I can't give you a piece of chicken. She says, I want a piece of chicken. So the guy says, all right, you know, I'm not going to fight with this lady. I'll give up, I'll, I'll leave my piece of chicken. I won't have my piece of chicken tonight. Okay, he goes over to the refrigerator, opens up the refrigerator. His three-year-old son had closed himself in the refrigerator and was already turning blue. And he opened up the refrigerator, was able to take the son out, and the son they saved his life. That's stuka tatsil mimavis. Stuka tatsil mimavis. That means the difference between that kid's life and death is this guy's decision to give the stuka. It stuck at that. So I heard about another, there's another guy who every night he had like a one and a half year old child and every night before he put his daughter to sleep, he had a little pushka over there. They had a little pushka and they would put a coin in and it stuck at, stuck at, she got stuck at, stuck at, and it stuck at, stuck at, he put a, he helped her to put a, train him from a young age, train especially the girls, from a young age to put the money into the stuck at, right? Stuck at, stuck okay. So one night, he hears noise coming from her room. He hears a sound coming from the baby's room. He put her, so he, hears, he put her asleep, then he leaves the room, and all of a sudden he hears, hears some sounds coming from her room. So he goes back to her and he sees what happened was when he bent over to put her into the crib, he had some, money, some coins in his pocket and the coins fell into the baby's crib. And what's the first thing a baby does with a coin? He put it in her mouth. So here's this one-year-old baby, but instead of putting it in her mouth, what was she doing? She's trying to reach the pushka over. She's got stuka, stuka, trying to put it in the stuka instead of putting it in her mouth. That's like, you know why babies put things in their mouth, by the way? Why do kids put, first thing they do, a little child, everything they pick up, they put right to the mouth. Why is that? You know why? Because that's the only sense that's developed by them. Their whole experience in life start out with nursing. Their whole experience is what they put in their mouth. They don't, they don't, know, they don't under, uh, know how to touch things and manipulate things. So in order to test the reality of the thing, they put it in their mouth. First thing is they put it in their mouth. So, so, so it's stuck a tatsu bimavis. Now, watch this. Take a look at the word. Well, how much do they give? Take a look at the fourth line. Zeyit nukola over al pikudim machatzisa shekel, a half shekel coin. So we'll have to talk about why they give a half shekel coin. We'll get talk about that in a second. But look at that word machatzis very, very carefully, gentlemen. What's the middle letter of the word machatzis? The, word, the middle letter. The middle letter. A tzaddik. What do you think tzaddik stands for? Do you see where I am? Fourth line. Fourth word on the fourth line from the top. Machatzis. What does a tzaddik stand for? Tzedakah. Tzaddik. Tzaddik, tzedakah, it's all the same word. Tzaddik stands for tzedakah. Take a look at the two letters on either side of the tzaddik. What do they spell? A ches on one side and a yud on the other side. Chai. Look at the two outside letters. A mem and a tuf. Mace. Right? Tzedaka brings life closer and it pushes death farther apart. Pushes death farther away. Tzedaka tatzil mimavis. Tzedaka, you got the chai, a ches and a yud surrounding it, and you got a mem tuf. Now, turn for a second, keep your finger out of the place or put the marker here for a second. And turn to Parshas Pinchas. What's that? Page. Uh, page 8. Uh, 876. Now if you remember the story, uh, you have a Jewish prince who consorts with a non-Jewish woman. Right? The guy, what's his name? Zimri starts up with Cosby, the Midianite princess. And what does Pinchas do? Takes the spear and he kills both of them. 
what was happening at the point that he was doing that, at the point, no, no pun intended, but at the, at the, at, right before Pinchas killed them, what was going on? There was a plague among the Jewish people, started dying. What did Pinchas do? Pinchas speared both of them, he killed both of them, and that put an end to the plague. Right? That put a stop to the plague. Look how the Torah describes it. Vedabra Hashem on Moshe Lemar, top of page 876, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron HaKoyin, Heishi ves chamosi me'al b'nei Yisrael. He turned back my wrath from the Jewish people. How did he turn back Hashem's wrath? By killing Zimri and Cosby, right? He turned back Hashem's wrath. Is that clear? Take a look at that word chamosi, my wrath. He turned back my wrath. Look at the two middle letters of the word chamosi. Second line on page 876. Fourth word, fifth word, chamosi. Look at the two middle letters. The two middle letters. Mace, death. Look at the two outside letters. Chai. He turned back my wrath. That means he turned it inside out. He moved the mace and switched it around to bring back the chai together. He turned back my wrath. So you have the saves, saves, from, saves from the it's a second line on page uh, 876. So you have the word over here, machatzis. Tzedakah brings death closer and it, push, it brings life closer, and it, puts, it pushes death farther apart. Okay, now, why a half shekel coin? Why is it a half shekel coin? If, let me ask you a question. If, you, if you're taking a coin for a census, for a census in America today, let's say you're going to have everybody give a coin. What would you have them give? A coin. What's that? A penny. A penny? Ooh, somebody's cheap. Oh, you guys are cheap. Boy, are you guys, I mean, if I was taking a sense, I would take the coin that represents one unit. I would take a coin that represents one unit. What is the one unit? A dollar. I would say, everybody, give a dollar. Why half a dollar? Especially if it's a command. I want everybody to give a half a dollar. Yeah, why half a dollar? Why half a dollar? I would say, give a dollar, whatever the coin is. What do you call it in South Africa? A rand. What do you call a rand? I don't know if they have, they still have them? Oh, okay. I don't know. I thought maybe they went out of circulation. The, uh, the what do you call it? The, uh, the, you know, what do you call it? Uh, a euro, uh, a euro, a pound, a pound in England. You ever, have, you ever pick up a, a pound coin, a pound coin in England? You pick up a point. I mean, that's a solid, it feels like money. A, point, a pound coin in England, that's solid. That's solid. That, that, that feels like money. So you take, take I gave him a pound. Give him, why a half a coin? Why machasis a shekel? Why is a half shekel coin? So, one of the ideas is that a person should realize, a person should realize we're not complete. That's the same thing we said when it came to the, when it came to the, uh, uh, what's it called, the, uh, the Aron Kodesh. Remember the half, the half uh, fraction of the Aron Kodesh. We're being counted. Being counted says you're significant. That's what a count is. When we count you, when we count you, that's telling you you're significant. One, two, three. Hoshia has a, you're a significant person. You're an individual who contributes to the Jewish people. Don't let it go to your head. Don't let it go to your head. You're still not complete. You're a half. You're, 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 there's still room to grow. Nobody's there. Nobody's at the finish line yet. So you take a half shekel coin, number one. Number two, this Parsha is really, the. remember they told you there's an opinion. They're going to use these coins as part of the Mishkan to build various, various, there are various things having to do with the Mishkan. The Mishkan was a response, according to most commentaries, the Mishkan was a response to what sin? The golden calf. The golden calf. Another, the golden calf is coming up later in this Parsha, but in the order of events, the golden calf actually took place earlier, and it was as a result of the golden calf that God says is an atonement, now you're going to have to build the Mishkan. That's what some commentaries, most commentaries probably say. Probably most, at least some, I think it's most, hold that way, that this is actually a response to the golden calf. And it's an atonement. Now, what happened after the golden calf? What did Moshe Rabbeinu do when he came down from the mountain? Smashed, Smashed the luchos. They broke the luchos. Therefore, what kind of coin do you give? Broken. A broken coin, meaning a half coin because it's an atonement for the broken luchos that came down from Har Sinai. Now, why is it, why is it that a... Um, Why is it that the Torah emphasizes in Posuk Tesva, five lines from the bottom? He Osher lo yarbe ve'adal lo yam it mi machatz Back on 484. The wealthy man should not give more, and a poor man should not give less than a half shekel coin. 
Law says, Trumas Hashem lechaper on nafsho sechem. Why is it that it's so urgent? You know, when it came to giving the donations for the building the Truma, when you learned in Parsha's Truma, how much were you allowed to give? As much as you wanted. There are raw materials. Everybody could give raw materials as much as they wanted. You want to give gold, give gold. You want to give, per, what do you call it, fabric, give fabric. You give as much as, there's no limit over there. What's the danger when you allow everybody to give as much as they want? Over here, the Torah says, everybody gives the same amount. Who is that a benefit for? Why? So they, wouldn't, they shouldn't be embarrassed. This way the poor get to feel that they're significant, right? That's true. But who else is it a benefit for? There's a benefit here for the rich people. What's the benefit for the rich people? Why is, why is giving a limitation, one standard coin, why is that a, why is that a benefit for the rich people also? Oh, yeah, you're very close. That means that when a rich man gives a lot, so it's very easy for them to feel, you know, well, you know, yeah, I gave that. Yeah. Now, so that means that there's a certain amount of, there's, listen, the Gemara says we, we, we respect rich people. It says, Rebbe Mechabed Esayashirim. Rebbe Yudah Nasi honored rich people. We do honor rich people. Rich, wealth is a bracha, gentlemen. Regardless of any jokes that anybody makes, wealth is a bracha. What that bracha is, is sometimes it's tricky. You know, the bracha can be misused. Take a look at Rashi for a second. Take a look at Rashi. Uh, uh, a fourth line from the, look at the right side, fourth line from the top. Zayitnu. This is what they should give. Take a look at what Rashi says. Zay, if you find it, please show the person next to you. This is what they should give. Says Rashi, Hashem showed him, Herelo kimin matbea shel esh. Hashem showed him, a coin of fire, made out of fire. Umishkala machatis a shekel. It weighed half a shekel. Ve'amar lo kezayitnu. This is what they should give. You know, it says that Moshe Rabbeinu, says that Moshe Rabbeinu, he had trouble understanding the menorah. And Hashem, he had to show him a picture of the menorah, eventually made the menorah. He said, throw the gold in and the menorah will come out. The menorah was very intricate, very elaborate. What the menorah was looked like, that's a fake menorah. I mean, how difficult is it to know what a coin looks like? Everybody likes money. Everybody knows what money looks like. So why is it so difficult? Hashem had to show him a coin of fire? What's too complicated? Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know what a coin looked like? A menorah, you listen, you're giving instructions, you got to put flowers and buttons and this and that on the menorah, and at the end of the day, you still didn't get it. Money? Well, oh, everybody hops money pretty quick. Kids like money. You don't think Mar says that. The Gemara in Gittin says that, where we're learning. Children like money. If adults like money, it's only a carryover from our youth. Kids like money. Yeah, yeah. I know a girl who said to her mother, what you, your mother asked her what she wants for her birthday. She said, I want a checkbook. Well, why do you want a checkbook? He says, well, I see you go into the store. You write whatever you get. You write out a check and you get what you want. I'd like a checkbook too. <laughs> huh? It's a real Jew. It's a real Jew. Now there's my cousin. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I once said to my father, I want to get life insurance. I was about 11 years old. I said, I want to get life insurance. He says, why? So I, I don't want to die. Yeah, I wasn't the sharpest knife in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I said, I knew that there's something called life insurance. I didn't understand how it works. How do they make sure you, how do they make sure you don't die? I, I, it was, it was, it was, to this day, I don't understand it. But the, uh, what do you call it? The, I knew there was something about it. I knew there was something about it. So, so the, uh, uh, <laughs> so she went, uh, kids like money. So why did he have to show them a coin of fire? And what did he have to do with the rich people? The answer is, first of all, a coin of fire, Hashem is showing Moshe Rabbeinu, not what the coin looks like. He's saying, this is how I want them to give it. Give it with the fire of enthusiasm. Give it with the fire of enthusiasm, number one. But number two, the Mephoshim say, money has great potential, but money has a potential to burn also. You can hurt people with money, you can hurt yourself with money. So a person has to know, they're different. Remember, did I ever tell you a story about the three brothers? I didn't tell you a story about the three. I think I did. The, the, okay, well, whatever it was. There was a guy, he had three sons. And on his, uh, his first son turned 18. And on the day he turned 18, a letter arrived in the mail from an anonymous donor. A million dollars has been sent from a lawyer. Let her arrive from a lawyer, an anonymous donor has given a million dollars for your son on his 18th birthday. Hmm, big simcha. What, an 18-year-old takes a million bucks and goes out and buys himself a? Fire. Of course. 
Ika da Amri, a sports car, right? There's the two versions of the Gemara, a car or a sports car, right? No one ever said, oh, a new tennis racket. No, 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 a car. Okay, so he gets this brand new sports car, 18-year-old in a sports car, driving around three weeks, and 90 miles an hour, hits a tree and dies instantly. Two years later, the second son turns 18. The day he turns 18, a letter from a lawyer, anonymous donor, a million bucks. This time the family's a little more cautious. Kid still has more money than he knows what's good than, than he should really have. Gets involved with the wrong friends, gets involved with drugs, becomes a drug addict, has to be institutionalized, his life is ruined. Two years later, third son turns 18. Letter arrives from a lawyer, anonymous donor, a million bucks. Father picks up the phone and says, we don't want the money. Lawyer says, I'm sorry, your son's 18, he's, a, he's legally an adult, he had to, you can't decline the money, he'd have to decline it. Father goes ballistic. He says, who keeps sending this money? The lawyer says to him, remember, about 20 years ago, you had a partner in business, and the two of you had a very nasty split. He made a lot of money, and he vowed one day he's going to get revenge. He decided the best way to get revenge is to send a million bucks to each of your sons on their 18th birthday. Looks like he was right. So money could be very destructive, and money could saddles a person with responsibility, and money could change a person. So it's a coin of fire. On the one hand, you could use it properly. On the other hand, you could burn yourself and burn other people with it. Number two, give it with enthusiasm. That's what I said. I want the people to give the money. You know, getting people to give money enthusiastically is not such an easy thing. Because Rokhu says, you know where this money came from? This money came from under Hashem's throne, the Kisei HaKavod. He pulled the coin, the Medrash says, he took the coin out from under the Kisei HaKavod, from under Hashem's throne. What does that mean? What does that mean? Why, why, why does he have money under the Kisei HaKavod? What does that mean? The answer is, if you use your money right, you can reach the Kisei HaKavod. How do you like that? And Rebbe used to honor wealthy people. Because wealthy people, it's a bracha. It's like watching somebody who's been given a bracha, obviously Hashem chose him to make him wealthy. And it is, when a wealthy, wealthy man walks into the room, what happens to everybody in the room? If, you know, if, if, if Bill Gates or Warren Buffett would walk into this room, what would happen? All attention and focus would be on them. And not only that, as soon as they started talking, if somebody was making a shh, it wouldn't be like somebody giving a sheer. Somebody's giving a sheer, somebody's talking in the corner, that's okay. But if Warren Buffett starts talking, if Bill Gates, oh, what's that? Now, first of all, everybody, isn't it amazing how clever they are and everybody laughs at their jokes? Oh, what, what, what witty, witty people they are. What well, they say the difference between uh, <laughs> if, 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 he's, uh, if, he's, uh, 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 if he doesn't have money, he's eccentric. If he has money, he's, he's witty. Right, something like that. Uh, no, oh no, if he doesn't have money, he's strange. If he has money, he's just eccentric. That's how it works. We cut them a lot of slack. Now, everybody hears a, a, a wealthy man walks into the room. People pay attention to him. Do you know that the Basilis Sharm says, if you have, I went to this Muster Sharm, maybe the Orchos Sadiqim says, let's say you're a member of a Jewish community and you've got a really good idea for the community. You know what you should do? Tell it over to a Torah scholar or a wealthy man. Let them present it because they might be listened to. Right? Nobody's going to listen to us. But if a wealthy man also, ooh, you know, oh, you obviously know what he's talking about. Not only that, when a wealthy man comes into the room, we all kind of feel maybe some of it will rub off on me. And in the best scenario, in the best scenario, if Warren Buffett would into the room, walk in the room, we're all be kind of just listening eagerly and hoping that at some point he's just going to say, I like you. Right? <laughs> That's what we're really hoping. I want you to be my, run my business now. Oh, my lucky day. There we go. So the Torah says, hey, listen, you've got to honor a wealthy man. You have to honor a wealthy man. It's a bracha, but it's a coin of fire. That coin could take you up to the Kisei HaKovod. That coin could burn you. Says the Torah, the wealthy man shouldn't give more. You know why? For once in his life, he's going to give purely L'Shem Shemayim, with no ulterior motivation. Sometimes he may give because he wants to boast a little bit. Maybe he wants a plaque. He wants a building named after him. He wants an awards day. He wants a dinner. He wants to be honored. There are a lot of reasons why a wealthy man could give. Here, there's no, no, there's no, there, there, there's no glory in this. Even the poor guys are giving the same amount that you're giving. Everybody's giving the same amount. Give it half a day. For once in your life, for sure, everybody is going to be giving, and it's going to be the shame shemaim. 
That's what the Torah says. Everybody's limited to half shekel coin. There was a guy, what's the guy's name? Uh, Larry Ellison? Is that his name? Ellison? Who, he's the head of, uh, or, I think, Oracle? You ever hear this guy? He's also one of these, one of these mega billionaires. So he was invited to speak at the graduation ceremony at Harvard University a few years ago. You can go back 10, 15 years ago. So he gets up at the graduation ceremony at Harvard. And this guy's a really, he's one of the 10 richest guys in the world. He gets up and he says, um, he gets up, he's the guest speaker, the keynote speaker. He gets up, he goes, uh, to the graduating class of Harvard University, I'd like to say, you know, I feel sorry for you. So everybody starts chuckling, because that's how speakers always start with something which, you know, then we're waiting for the punchline. What did you really mean by that? You know, that sort of thing. He goes, I really feel sorry for you, because uh, graduating Harvard, you've basically sentenced yourself to a lifetime of financial mediocrity. If you look at the list of the 10 wealthiest people in the world, 9 out of 10 never went to college at all. All you guys are going to do is be working for people who never went to college. So I, and as he went on, People started catching that he wasn't playing around. He was telling he was telling these Harvard graduates that they're a bunch of that they're a bunch of losers. That's what he was telling them. So eventually, they had to send the baby ushers to pull him down off of the podium because he was just knocking and ruining the entire graduation ceremony. I love it. It was Harvard too. They got what they deserve. Yeah. <laughs> they what goes around comes around. <laughs> Harvard got it good and proper. They deserved it, and they deserve it even more now. So, so, so that's why it says that everybody is going to give everybody's going to, going to give the same amount. Okay, now take a look at um, let's see what else have we got. Um, yeah, the idea of account. This is very important. The whole idea of account is to remind us to remind us when you're counted. When you're counted, that tells you that you're significant. What does it mean to be significant as a Jew? If you tell a person, you are a number, you are a number, one, two, three, every single person is a number in the count. What that tells you is that every single person is under Hashem's direct divine supervision. That means we're not just like kind of fit into the crowd and you just go with the crowd type of thing. Every single Jew has got direct, direct connection up and down with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Torah is reminding you with account, every single Jew is significant. Don't ever forget you're significant. And that significant really means to a Jew, what does it mean I'm significant? It means that there's Hashgacha Pratis. It means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is directly involved in your life. Since he's directly involved in our life, that saddles us with the responsibility to do what Hashem wants. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. We want to get on to uh, the golden calf. We're going to get to the golden calf either tomorrow or on Tuesday. Mirza Shev.